One of the most heavily debated topics between sports fans in this day and age is who is the GOAT? Who is the greatest of all time at their respective positions in their sport? Everybody has their opinion, everybody has their lists and different criteria to assess where each player should be ranked. So when discussing the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history, what is the criteria that most people use to determine who should be ranked where? A lot of people, especially when discussing the greatest quarterbacks of all time, like to point to team achievements such as rings and postseason success, but most people will use the arguments of individual records and statistics, whether that be for a single season or a career. I think wins are important to an extent, but they will never tell the whole story because quarterbacks never play against each other directly like opponents do in tennis or boxing or golf. There is almost always one quarterback who has the upper hand in the game thanks to their team and the game can often be decided by a team's defense when a QB isn't even on the field. Personally, I think individual records and stats along with the eye test, which is of course assessing somebody's talent and ability through what you see when you watch them play, are the two most important factors in the GOAT discussion. But the thing is, you can never truly compare stats and records. Some players are gifted with an excellent system and elite talent which have inflated their numbers. Others aren't so lucky. There isn't a magic formula which can tell you exactly how one QB would perform in another system. For example, we don't know for sure how the record book would look if Peyton Manning played for the Patriots under Bill Belichick, and he had the benefit of having consistently elite defenses which almost always finish in the top 10 in points allowed per game. In case you doubt the importance of a great defense, Tom Brady has never won a Super Bowl without a top 8 scoring defense. And the same is true on the flip side, we don't know for certain how Tom Brady would have done in Indianapolis if he had the likes of Marvin Harrison, Reggie Wayne, Dallas Clark, and Austin Carly to throw the ball to and of course Andrew and James to hand the ball off to. But on the flip side, never really having those elite defenses which the Patriots hand on the Belichick. There's also no magic formula for calculating how John Elway would have fared at playing under Bill Walsh's system in San Francisco in the West Coast offense and having the likes of Jerry Rice, John Taylor, Tom Raffin and Roger Craig to work with. And we don't know how Joe Montana would have done playing in Dan Reeves' conservative system. That's because there isn't a formula which takes into account talent. But I did come up with a formula for calculating inflation between eras. Something which is often talked about in these discussions is how modern day quarterbacks would fare playing back in the days when there weren't so many rules benefiting the offense in the passing game. But it's hard to tell for sure how stats translate to other eras. So I came up with a formula which takes into account how impressive the numbers are compared to their peers. When I was at college at the University University in Iowa, I took a stats class and one day when studying probability and forecasting, I, a thought came to me. Could I come up with a formula to calculate inflation in passing yards in the NFL? Around the same time, a guy named Patrick Mahomes was tearing up the NFL and he had set new passing records at a lightning quick pace. One of the records he set around this time was fewest NFL games played to throw for 100 touchdown passes, which he did in 40 starts, tossing his 100th scoring strike in week 9 of the 2020 NFL season. The record was previously held by Miami Dolphins legend Dan Marino, who set the record back in the early to mid-1980s in 44 games. So I saw this record as the perfect opportunity to come up with a formula to see how quickly Mahomes would have passed for 100 touchdowns between 1983 and 1986, and how many touchdowns Marino would have passed for in today's pass-heavy league, more specifically between 2017 and 2020. After researching this topic for days on end, I perfected my formula as best as I possibly could, and I wrote an article for the college's newspaper, The Tack, which I will leave a link to in the comment section below, explaining how it works and explaining the rule changes in the NFL which have occurred since 1986, making the formula necessary in the first place. But before I tell you how the formula works and what the results were, here's some information on how passing stats in the NFL became inflated in the first place. So in some context, in 1984, Dan Marino became the first quarterback to ever throw for 5,000 yards in a single season, and the first to pass for over 40 touchdowns. Marino passed for a whopping 5,084 yards and 48 touchdowns in 1984. While he never lived up to that lofty standard that he set that season ever again in his career, he continued to put up jaw-dropping numbers. So it came as no surprise that Marino set the record for fastest player to reach 100 touchdown passes. Marino retired in 1999 with almost every meaningful all-time and single-season passing record, thanks to having arguably the fastest release of any quarterback in the history of the game. The records Marino held were once considered to be unbreakable. That was until the league changed the rules to make the game easier for passing. In the late 1990s, the NFL started to put rules in place which made passing the ball easier. The biggest rule change of all came in 2004 when the following rule was put in place. If a defender maintains contact with an eligible receiver 5 yards beyond the line of scrimmage, it is illegal contact. This results in a 5 yard penalty and an automatic first down for the offense. It also made pass interference penalties. This rule also made pass interference penalties more common. 
This essentially took away the physical cornerback position and paved way for small and speedy slot receivers who likely would have been thrown around like ragdolls before 2004 to succeed. As I'm sure you can imagine, passing yards and touchdowns have gone through the roof since. This is very similar to how passing stats went through the roof after 1978 when the Mel Blunt rule was introduced, as was a rule allowing offensive linemen to extend their arms whilst pass protecting. I'm sure some of you were making that comment at home, and yes, of course, the formula also applies to passing stats from pre-1978, but back to the 2004 illegal contact rule. It's no coincidence that in 2004, Annapolis Colts quarterback Peyton Manning surpassed Dan Marino's single season touchdown record by one. Manning passed for an impressive 49 touchdowns that year. His previous personal best was 33, so clearly the 2004 illegal contact rule had an impact. It also led to Marino's single season passing record eventually being broken. This record is now held by, again, Peyton Manning, who threw for 5,477 yards in his historically dominant 2013 season. There are currently nine single season totals that have eclipsed Dan Marino's 1984 season, all of which came in the 2010s or the 2020s. On a side note, several of these seasons came in 2011 following a lockout offseason which prohibited teams from practicing, giving defenses a great disadvantage and thus inflating passing yards from that season in particular. But back to the main point, it is widely accepted amongst both NFL fans and analysts that this is not because the players from the past decade are better than their predecessors, although there are fans who regularly make that argument. It's because the statistics are inflated, large in part due to the rule changes benefiting the passing game, most notably of course the 2004 illegal contact rule. But also the rules protecting the quarterback in the pocket and limiting defenseless hits on receivers leading to considerably more creative schemes being drawn up by offensive coaches, which offensive players of yesteryear never had the luxury of. To put it bluntly, the modern day rules make passing the ball easier than ever before, therefore modern stats are inflated. On another side note, today's NFL might be considerably easier for offensive players, but with that being the case, it's harder for defenses too. Something that should be taken into account when discussing the greatest defensive players in NFL history, especially defensive backs. Perhaps lockdown corners of the late 2000s and 2010s such as Darrell Reeves deserve more props than we give them credit for. So without further ado, the formula for comparing Marino and Mahomes goes as follows. So you're going to record how many touchdown passes Patrick Mahomes had in each of his games leading up to his 100th touchdown pass. And then you record how many total touchdowns were scored in the NFL through by a passing the week of those games. You record the number of NFL games played per week for those games. So today there were 32 teams. In the late 80s there were 28. So more games are played to, in today's league. Then you repeat the first three steps for Dan Marino leading up to his 100th touchdown pass. You take the total number of touchdown passes for either player, multiply it by the calculated average number of games played, and then you divide by the other player's average. So that's 15 over 14 for Marino, or 14 over 15 for Mahomes, because back in the 80s there were no bye weeks, and there were fewer teams, so it was always 14 games per week in the 80s. In modern times, there's an average of 15 games played per week. Sometimes there's 16, sometimes there's 15, uh, sometimes there's 14, but it averages out to 15. And then you divide this number by the total number of touchdowns passed in the NFL during the other player's era, and it will equal a percentage. You take that percentage and multiply it by the number of touchdowns scored in the time period for the other player. The answer will tell you how many touchdowns Mahomes would have had in 44 games from 1983 to 86, and how many Marino would have in 40 games between 2017 and 2020. The results show that Dan Marino accounted for 6.151% of touchdown passes in his first 44 games in the NFL, but when the 15 over 14 part of the equation is accounted for to adjust for the era, it equals 5.741%. The total number of touchdown passes between 2017 and 2020 in the 40 weeks leading up to Mahomes' 100th touchdown pass was 1,927. So 5.714% of 1,927 is 111. Therefore, we can conclude that theoretically, Dan Marino would pass for 111 touchdowns in the same time frame that Mahomes passed for 100. This equates to 2.766 touchdown passes per game, and when you divide 100 by 2.766, you get 36.15. That means Marino would in all likelihood throw his 100th touchdown pass in the first quarter of his 36 NFL games as a starter in today's league. Four games sooner than it took Mahomes to reach the century mark. As for the NFL superstar quarterback of the present, Patrick Mahomes accounted for 5.241% of the 1,927 touchdown passes in the league in his first 40 games. 
With the total number of touchdown passes and multiplied by 14 over 15 to adjust for era, this equals 5.616% of the total touchdown passes. There were 1,642 touchdown passes in the 100 games leading to Marino's 100th touchdown pass. So 5.616% of 1,642 is 92.2. Therefore, we can conclude that Patrick Mahomes would pass for 92 touchdowns in the same 44 weeks it took Marino to pass for 100. This equates to 2.091 touchdowns per game. When you divide 100 by 2.091, it equates to 47.82. That means it would theoretically take Mahomes until the fourth quarter of his 47th game in the league to reach a century mark for touchdown passes if he was to play from 1983 onwards. I rounded it up to 48 in the spreadsheet because that's what you're supposed to do in stats, but you get the picture. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes and Dan Marino played in very different eras with different teammates against different competitions and different systems. I certainly consider Mahomes' teammates and system to be superior to Marino's. Most people would agree that Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill are deadlier weapons than Marino's Marx brothers. Also, Chiefs head coach Andy Reid is widely considered to be an offensive guru, whereas former Dolphins head coach Don Shuler admitted himself on several occasions that he was a defense first head coach. The competition was also obviously different for both. The formula and statistics do not take into account these variables. I think that Patrick Mahomes is an extraordinarily talented quarterback. I have no doubt that Mahomes would have been successful playing for any team in any system in any era. But would he have been as good as Marino in the 80s? Would many people consider him to be the best quarterback in the league today if Prime Dan Marino was playing in today's league? According to the inflation formula, the answer is no, but he'd still be a pretty damn good QB. He'd average over 33 touchdown passes per season in the mid-1980s, and back in those days, they were second-team All-Pro numbers. But even if the half-a-billion-dollar QB could go back in time, Dan Marino would still be the main event. So the next time you debate who's better based on stats, just know that each era is different and stats become less and less valuable over time. Just like money. A million dollars in 2022 is a hell of a lot of money, but a million dollars in 1984? It was worth almost triple that. More often than not, the same applies to sports stats. 